target of the gymnastics scandal. Yes, there's always going to be like evil people in the world, but they don't have to get away with it. The cost of Russia's shadow war. And gamers on a train. And the theme for Train Jam 2018 is... The Larry Nasser sexual abuse scandal deepened even further today, as authorities charged Nasser's former boss at Michigan State with criminal sexual conduct of his own and willful neglect of duty by a public official. Counts three and four apply to his supervision, or quite frankly, his lack of supervision of Larry Nasser. These may not be the only new charges. The Texas Rangers are conducting a criminal investigation into the former USA Gymnastics Training Center known as The Ranch, which sits on the property of legendary coaches Marta and Bella Caroli, and may have given Nasser the perfect place to abuse young athletes at will. I like that it's like down and dirty. Like it's not about being pretty, it's not about perfecting your routines, it's simply self-defense. I find that empowering. It has a good workout. Maddie Larson was a world-class gymnast and a fan favorite. She was an Olympic hopeful, but she quit at the height of her career to escape the USA gymnastics system. Over and over again in the victim impact statements, we heard USAG. You know, it wasn't just about Larry Nassar, it was about the broader organization. Why was that? I don't think it's possible for someone like Larry to get away with doing what he did for 20 plus years if it's not in a corrupt environment and organization. I just don't really see how that would work. Gymnastics is not like football or basketball. It's not a big part of high school sports. So the Olympic path leads through private clubs for girls, who often start intensive training when they're eight or nine. More than 3,000 clubs across all 50 states are governed by USAG. And from 2001 to 2016, the power center of USAG was national team coordinator Marta Caroli. Marta's tough, but it's tough love. And if there's one thing that's been proven and reproven and reproven again for 30 years now is that the Caroli method works. It wins the medals that these kids so desperately want. Marta Caroli and her husband Bella defected from Romania, where they were celebrated coaches. They were known for winning medals, but also for harsh methods, which former gymnasts say crossed the line from training to abuse. Caroli was so successful in the U.S. that the Gymnastics Olympic Training Center came to be located at their home in remote Texas in 2011, where top gymnasts met for about a week every month. Welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica, and here with Spencer. Jessica O'Byrne did gymnastics as a kid. She created Gymcastic, a podcast about gymnastics, in 2012. Everybody knew Marta was totally, it was all out in the public. Everybody knew she was super abusive. Everybody knew what happened in Romania. Nobody cared. And that kind of thing can't go on anymore. So that's a huge deal. Gymcastic was one of the only outlets to closely cover the sport. And she got tips about the ranch. What were the rules of Corolla Camp? Ugh. The rules were never show any weakness. You don't talk, you don't giggle. You work out twice a day. There's not a lot of time to do homework or study. Up until February 2018, you could not bring a parent or chaperone with you to the ranch. It's really culty to like separate people from their family like that. Dude, it's so culty. Like if you met a stranger and they told you those were the rules for making your Olympic dreams happen, wouldn't you just slap them in the face and walk away? The Caroli's lawyers didn't answer requests for comment. They have denied abuse allegations in the past. Several former elites have said there was no nutritionist at the ranch. In a sport where your strength to weight ratio matters, Caroli favored thinness. And because club coaches had to please her, many of them favored thinness too. Now you lost some weight. Now you don't put it. Exactly. I don't, I don't want it. Yeah. Larson, who started going to the ranch when she was 13, eventually developed an eating disorder. Did people put pressure on, your, on you about your weight at the ranch? 
you would see like Marta would kind of look around and she would comment when people had like very little food on their plate. And she'd be like, eating so well, I see. And you'd have like a piece of chicken this big and like a grain of rice. <laughs> Weren't you tired? Yes, I was so tired. I always felt like I was gonna pass out at the end of practice. Around the age of 15 or 16, I started taking so many laxatives every day. And it was insane. Like my focus of practice was not like gymnastics. It was like, don't shit your pants in your leotard. Gymnastics is dangerous and injuries are common at the elite level. But the ranch was far from a hospital. When you needed treatment, you saw Nasser, who in addition to abusing athletes, let them compete with injuries. He let us compete when we were super injured. After I had like one of my worst injuries, I hurt both of my feet really badly at the same time. He didn't wrap them whatsoever. I didn't get a wheelchair. I had to stay the rest of the camp, crawling on my hands and knees. Or in that end room, they were like office chairs, like rolling ones, and I'd roll around. And that's how I got around. That's so crazy. Can, like, and he's a doctor, I know. I know. But like, what did all, all these adults do while there's like a teenage girl? Crawling? Nothing. What was it like when you won your first championship? We just went event to event to event, and halfway through bars, I just knew that we were gonna win it. And it was like, finally. The Carolin model is not the only one that wins. NCAA gymnastics is known for being more humane than the elite system. Valerie Condos Field won six national championships, and she coached Larson at UCLA. We bought into the belief that we have to strip them of their voice and their sense of individuality in order to be successful. And I don't believe that. What is that like, sort of reintroducing them to the broader world? I make a point of not talking to them about gymnastics hardly at all. When we're in the gym, I'll coach them about gymnastics. But when they stop by my office, I don't talk about gymnastics. And they're guarded, and then you start to see the shield start to part, and they start trusting. So it's developing the trust. I care about them more as a human being than an athlete. College gymnasts are allowed to have a personality. They also have medical care and education. Many have nutritionists. And since 1991, NCAA rules have said they're allowed to practice only 20 hours a week, less than half of what most elites do. I don't blame Marta. That's all she knew. I blame our system that embraced that way of coaching. We needed to supervise that. We needed to have accountability for the mental, emotional, and physical welfare of our athletes. We didn't do that. Instead of challenging some of those techniques, there was more a culture of don't ask questions, like this is what works. Right, yes. USAG has changed the elite system. It shut down the ranch, and it live streamed the camps once held there in private. Multiple congressional committees are investigating USAG. In February, Congress passed a law making reporting abuse mandatory for organizations like it. USA Gymnastics was fostering a culture that put money and medals first, far ahead of the safety and well-being of athletes. USAG told Vice News it's cooperating fully with the investigations, but won't comment on the ranch amid litigation. Last week, USAG filed a motion to dismiss lawsuits against it related to Nasser. It's just, time is really up. Like, the world doesn't have to be this way. Yes, there's always going to be, like, evil people in the world, but they don't have to get away with it. And you don't have to just take it, because I did that. And it sucks. Like, it sucks. An American airstrike in eastern Syria last month reportedly killed or wounded as many as 300 Russian mercenaries working with pro-Assad fighters. The private military contractors were part of an attack on an oil field near Deir ez-Zor, held by anti-Assad Kurdish fighters, supported by U.S. special forces. The Pentagon hasn't publicly acknowledged that Russians were killed in the strike, 
The Russian foreign ministry has admitted only that up to five of its citizens might have died in Syria, and that they traveled there of their own accord. It's part of a systematic effort by the Kremlin to downplay its role in the bloody ground war. But as the casualties mount, it's Russians themselves who are beginning to ask more questions. Ну, ми замечательно общались, лучше, чем многие люди в браке общаются. Even though Nadezhda Kozaterova split from her husband Igor years ago, the two remain close, raising their children together. Ну, при всем при этом, да, вот патриотизм, православие, все в приоритете. Last September, Igor set off for Syria to work as a private military contractor. He had done this kind of work before, in Chechnya and Ukraine. But around the time of the U.S. airstrike in Syria last month, Igor stopped calling home. Сейчас скажу, 9 или 10 числа мне позвонил его товарищ, приятель, и приехал к нам домой с дочкой и сказал, что Игорь погиб. Но он тоже не видел ни тела, ни документов. Как восприняла? Во-первых, я до сих пор не верю, что это правда. Это точно. Azbest is a town of 70,000 people in central Russia. Outside of the massive asbestos mine, job prospects are limited. This lack of opportunity and a strong sense of nationalism among men who have been soldiers before has made becoming a military contractor an attractive option. Natalia Korlova is a politician for the local branch of the Communist Party. She was one of the few officials to speak out after four local men went missing in Syria. Они должны были воевать в составе регулярных вооруженных сил Российской Федерации. Но э, власть, чтобы сэкономить, они очень удобно получается не нести за них ответственность. Что-то случилось, не надо выплачивать пенсионному фонду Российской Федерации пособие. Крылова's vocal opposition is rare, even for families of the missing. Это, это скрывается на самом деле. Жены не хотят об этом говоря, говорить, родственники особо тоже не хотят об этом говорить. Потому что если ты это выкладываешь в интернет, то появляются жители других городов и начинают писать нехорошие вещи про ребят. Russian military contractors got their start in Ukraine in 2014. They offered the Kremlin an attractive combination — effectiveness and deniability. When Russia intervened in Syria a year later, it applied the same privatized strategy. Officially, 48,000 Russian troops have served in Syria, and fewer than 50 have died. But unofficially, it's a different picture. At least 400 mercenaries are thought to have been killed in combat. Using private contractors allows the Kremlin to keep those casualties off its books. In support of President Putin's narrative that, unlike the unpopular wars in Afghanistan and Chechnya, Syria has been a relatively bloodless intervention. Вот они с рыбалки с детьми возвращаются. Замученных детей, двое замученных детей и довольно папаши. Igor and Nadezhda's daughter, Masha, celebrated her 18th birthday waiting for official word about what happened to her father. Что он в состоянии там двигаться, разговаривать, он бы нашел способы с нами связаться и Машу поздравить. Мы ни правды не знаем, ни... и даже не, не надеемся ее прочь узнать. Two weeks later, a war veterans group returned Igor's body to Azbest. The only explanation his family got was that he died for the motherland. There's a lot that's confusing about the Cambridge Analytica Facebook story. But at the heart of it is a really simple motivation. Political campaigns want to advertise to voters in the most efficient way possible. That means they want to find voters at times when they're paying attention and show them an ad that engages them. Sometimes they use TV. President Trump's campaign reportedly targeted The Walking Dead with TV ads because they thought a lot of people who were scared about immigration watched that show. More and more these days, campaigns use the internet for their targeted advertising. Because almost everything you do on the internet is tracked. 
which allows people who want to influence you to get really specific in their targeting. That's just behind this whole Facebook Cambridge Analytica mess. Facebook offers advertisers a convenient way to find people in very specific categories based on what they do on Facebook. Cambridge Analytica got some of that Facebook data and offered to use it for campaigns to do even more specific targeting. Several Republican campaigns took them up on the offer. The issue is the way Cambridge got the data. It got a hold of information from hundreds of thousands of Facebook users who signed up for an app that didn't reveal the data would be used for political purposes. But the rest of it, what they used that data to do, that's the way campaigns work. Tom Bonnier is the CEO of Target Smart, a firm that does a lot of the targeting work for Democratic campaigns and progressive organizations. And we talked today about what campaigns do quite legally with all the Easter eggs you leave all over the place. We're taking a lot of data from, you know, like I said, publicly available sources, commercially available sources, and we're throwing it all together. Most of it is frankly useless. If we're talking about maybe 1,500 different data points on an individual, we allow the computers to build algorithms that will say, look, this specific data point, whether or not you are someone who likes to go on cruise ships, is predictive of who you're gonna support for president. So how many voters do you have uh, data for? So uh, there are- I mean, I mean, Americans, I should say, how many people do you have data for? 265 million, about 265 million. About 200 million of those are registered voters. Do you know who my friends are on Facebook? No. Do you know what websites I go to? No. Uh, do you know what purchases I make, sort of like on a day-to-day -day basis? I don't. Uh, do you know what I watch on TV? No. Um, do you know who I call on the phone? <laughs> I don't. Do you know who's in my phone? I don't. In your case, we have your cell phone number. Uh, we know which elections you voted in in the past. We know that you voted uh, early in the 2016 election, as many Americans did. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea in avoiding the lines. Reporter on the road, you never go <laughs> for election day. <laughs> so at this level, you can see some basic top line information. Our data set believes that you're an African American. Okay. Uh, I have not done Ancestry.com, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, sitting across from you, I think it's fairly safe to say that you're not. Okay. Uh, and so why is that? Uh, it's because uh, that's not information that you provide when you register to vote. It is uh, not something that a commercial company is going to collect on you. And we have your name uh, and we have the area you live in, the block that you live in specifically. And so the area that you live in, at least at the time of the last census, which is now getting a bit old, was a majority African-American area. So that actually drives a lot of the other things that we know about you. Our partisan model says that there's a 93.7% chance that you self-identify as a Democrat. Now, I can tell you that's entirely because uh, the file believes that you're an African-American. African-American man living in Washington, D.C. is overwhelmingly likely to self-identify as a Democrat. Now that I'm sitting across from you, I'd look at that and say, well, that model probably should be somewhere closer to 50-50. What people are concerned about is they feel like everything they're liking and clicking on Facebook that like all these campaigns know about it. Now, Facebook, they know who you are. And if you go to them and say, you want to speak with certain types of, of, of voters, they'll facilitate that, that communication, but they're not going to tell you who they are. We have a good sense of who we need to talk to. And they, they can say, look, Facebook, uh, these are the, the million voters that we want to talk to. We know why. We don't care what they like or anything. We just want to put our ads in front of them. And that's what a lot of campaigns are doing now. Amtrak's California Zephyr is a cross-country train that's normally full of sightseers and train enthusiasts. Here we go. And the theme for Train Jam 2018 is... Odyssey. Don't just make a bunch of Mario Odyssey games, you know. But each year, a group of video game developers, artists, and musicians hop on to take part in an event called Train Jam. Hey, how's it going? 340 participants from 30 countries will get on the train in Chicago. And in the 52 hours it takes to get to San Francisco, they'll try to create a video game completely from scratch. Most people get started before the train even leaves the station. 
I'm from Palestine. I met uh, a new guy from, he's a uh, Syrian. Both of us are uh, like um, uh, affected by the policies in the US. You're gonna hook up with a Syrian to make a game specifically about US politics in the US on a train. Yeah, that's weird, yeah. What are you hoping to make? So the idea is a high tension, kind of slow moving multiplayer game where you're all balloons and you're using the environment to try and pop and destroy each other. Wow. So It turns out some of those games are harder to make than they sound, like Alex and Rashid's game about fake news. How's the game coming along? Ah, uh, it's not going well. Okay. We have a really great high concept, but we forgot to add the great gameplay. <laughs> Maybe this is the fun part of it. <laughs> what we've discovered with the balloon game is I came up with a great idea that forces us into a position of more or less coming up with an, our own physics engine. Okay. Which is a bad idea. You wanna go look at it now? Let's go look at it. All right. Cause I'm scared. So what do we got here? Here we go. Oh yeah. What's gonna happen? <laughs> the lead red balloon. What you do is like you walk on these springs and you can see the white area. That's where you're supposed to walk. Okay. And you're kind of collecting all these little green guys, you know, and I have these wet glasses that make people kind of experience it even more. I like the diffraction glasses. Oh my god. <laughs> Aside from it being on a train, the whole thing pretty much looks like a standard programming jam. Also, be able to use people chug Gatorade and scarf down ramen and Oreos, and a lot of people pull all-nighters. But not everybody. There's no Wi-Fi on the train, so you can't Google your programming questions or get sidetracked by Facebook. But the scenery can get a little distracting. Some people like staring at the Sierra Nevada mountains or watching the Rockies roll by while they code. But other developers hide out in their rooms and try to finish up their projects. <laughs> Idril Wallach started Train Jam five years ago. Back then, there were only a few dozen people. But this year, they've had to rent out the entire train and add a couple of extra cars just to accommodate everyone. And it's turned into a place where newcomers and established professionals can learn from each other. So people are coming here, they're making projects. Yeah. Do any of these end up developing into some hugely viral game or something like that? I know that there's some apps up on the App Store for sale. We have a few people who their games have then gone on to be shown at events, so I get to look at that and go, I helped facilitate that game existing. <laughs> this is kind of like a really high pressure incubator yeah. that is moving. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it, high pressure incubator. Oh dear. Train Jam is not a competition, and there's no awards at the end of the ride. For most people, if you made something that's playable, you count that as a win. Oh, oh come yeah. on. <laughs> I did nothing wrong. <laughs> Rashid and Alex went their separate ways. Like, it's a political game, mm -hmm. so he's just, maybe he's scared of that. He wants to make something ambitious and awesome. Like, that's, that doesn't really work in Train Jam, honestly. You need to make something that can be done in a short amount of time. And then, you know, you gotta make sure it's finished. Hi, come on in. Jerry and Mike's balloon game finally came together. Whoa, these knives are wild, man. This is, okay. <laughs> okay, it worked because I ran myself into a cactus. Okay, this is a game. If you see any garbage, just throw it away. Even if it's not yours. Sorry. Thank you. What's next? Uh, take a shower, eat a nice hot meal, and then lay in a bed where it's not like moving and you just get under the covers and it's the most like euphoric thing that you're gonna feel in a while.
That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, March 27th.